Awesome. Let's do that. Um, so, uh, before I even say anything else, I am going to draw your attention to this URL, which will take you to um, this slide deck as well as, I mean, actually, if you go to this URL, you'll find that it actually takes you to a much longer slide deck. Uh, and the part that we're about to talk to is actually like the middle section of that slide deck. So um, what you'll figure out when you look at the first page is I'm actually reusing a deck that I used in, in October somewhere else, and you'll see that there. Uh, the reason I do that is just because there's a whole bunch of introductory Happy Fire stuff in there, and if you want a refresher on any of that, that's all in there. There's also a bunch of advanced topics that come after this section all in the same slide deck. So. Um, yeah, so that's all in there. Um, this session, of course, is all about building Fire servers using Happy Fire. Um, I should mention, I guess, also, this topic is frankly way too long for the amount of time we've got here. Um, I mean, the, the, this section of the slides, like it, it would be easy for us to spend two hours doing this. And we've got, I think, 40 minutes or so. But we'll be fine with that. This is a bit of a, a whirlwind tour of how you build servers in Happy Fire. Uh, but all of the information is all in here. There's loads of code samples. There's all kinds of things like that. So certainly don't worry if you don't catch everything here. Feel free to check out the slides. Feel free to check out the sample project, which I will direct you to in a minute. Um, I think just because I jumped straight into the middle of this deck, there's a slide right at the start that I probably should have brought here. Um, I will mention all of the material that I'm about to go through is Creative Commons licensed, so you are absolutely welcome to take this content back to your own companies and give this talk yourself or come to Dev Days and take my spot and give this presentation. All is good. Uh, this is free material. All of the code samples I'm going to show you are all Apache 2 licensed, so I, I'm a big open source guy. All of this stuff is totally free. So. I do seriously mean it. Take this content, deliver it yourself. It's yours. Here's what we're going to talk about, is the stuff in yellow on this slide. So the beginner session this morning, we talked about Fire's data model in Happy. We talked about how to do parsers. We talked about clients. Uh, and then we left it at that. The thing that I call part two here uh, is servers. And I'm going to talk in the next 40 minutes about our two server frameworks. Uh, and then there is a bunch of stuff at the end that goes into subjects like validator and the testing overlay. And every time I do this presentation, I think, why is that weird square at the top? And I make a note to myself to fix that. And I forget about it until the next time I'm in front of anyone. Huh. Good. So let's talk about the server framework. So. Um, Happy includes, as I said, uh, you know, tons and tons of stuff. We have got a full-blown client framework. We've got you know, parsers and data models and all of that stuff. But the very first thing we did when we were writing the library was, was develop a server framework on top of it. This was actually use case number one for Happy Fire. Um, the reason that we actually built the entire library uh, was at the time I was working at a, a, a hospital up in Toronto where I live called University Health Network. And we had, much like I'm sure some of your, your own organizations have, a whole bunch of legacy systems. I mean, every hospital out there has some database with a bunch of great data in it, in it or some EHR system that they've had for 20 years that is awesome but horrible at the same time. Like, we've all got these systems. And we had built all of these SOAP web services on top of a bunch of our systems. And I'm sure some of you guys have worked with SOAP and realize it's, you know, it's nice because it's flexible, but it's horrible because it's this awful XML and security is terrible in it. And there's lots of reasons to hate SOAP. So we looked at Fire right when it first came on the scene and thought, this, thing, this looks great. Let's, uh, let's find some way of putting Fire interfaces on top of our legacy systems. Um, and all of that turned into Happy Fire. That was the origin of the libraries. We wanted to support sort of modern protocols on top of a bunch of legacy systems. I mean, of course, the library has gone in all kinds of directions since there, and there's loads of other features and modules and things you can do with it. But this section is, is like use case 1.0 for why we developed the library. And it maintains, it sort of, it remains a really popular thing to do. 
Um, our, our sort of philosophy in designing the library has been we're really heavily inspired by Spring. And if you're a Java developer, you've probably spent lots of time either loving or hating the Spring framework, and it's usually 50-50 in any given room. Um, the one thing that's really nice about Spring is it's super modular. It's really easy for you to take a piece of that library, forget about the rest of it, and use it in combination with whatever technology mix you have in your, in, in your application. We've tried really hard to stick to that ethos by creating sort of a, a pluggable framework for Fire that lets you take bits of it and leave other bits and replace and customize bits of it. So we've, we've tried really hard to go through all of that. Um, we're pretty heavily inspired by frameworks like JAXRS and REST Easy and the million REST frameworks that exist in, in the Java ecosystem. Um, our server framework is not any of those things, though. It is its own standalone um, REST framework, so you don't need to be using JAXRS or, Easy Mo or REST Easy, rather, or any of those things. It is a sort of a, a self-encompassed standalone thing. The way it works is as follows. Um, our server works, you basically write these, these sort of POJO classes, these little classes that implement whatever storage logic you have. And then the server framework takes care of, of sort of standing, on, standing an HTTP server on top of that. Um, if that didn't make sense, I always find this part weird to explain, but sort of picture it like this. You're going to write a bunch of Java code that is effectively methods that implement the logic for what you want your server to do. So if you want to have a patient resource served up and you want to support reading a patient resource and you want to support updating a patient resource and you want to support creating a patient resource, the whole design of the server is that you're gonna create a class and you're just gonna create three methods on there, one called read, one called update, and one called create. Those methods will implement your storage logic, whether it's you know, talking to a database or reading to a, from a file or maybe calling some SOAP service that your legacy system supports. Like whatever your thing is, you'll write code that deals with it, but all you're doing is writing ja plain Java sort of methods. The happy framework takes those and turns them into an HTTP server that sits on top of that. Um, hopefully that made sense. It's, I always have trouble with that explanation. Um, so happy, of course, on top of the methods you write, takes care of all of the annoying complexities of, of, of Fire servers. Fire, of course, defines its own sort of escape syntax for search parameters, and it's got its own rules for how RESTful URLs work and all of that. All of that is the plumbing that Happy Fire takes care of um, in order to let you sort of write your business logic, basically. So the way this all works is you effectively, in order to build a server using Happy Fire's server framework, are responsible for creating two things. First off, uh, the thing on the right is you create these classes called resource providers. A resource provider is a collection of methods that implements all of your functionality for a given resource type. So if you're creating a server that, for example, serves up patient resources, encounter resources, and diagnostic report resources, which is a pretty common combination, then you're going to create three resource provider classes, and you'll probably call them patient resource provider and encounter resource provider and diagnostic report resource provider. In each of those classes, you're going to create methods that implement the logic you want, and I'll show you examples of those in a moment, but You'll create sort of these methods that implement the, the various fire operations you want to support. And that's basically it. The only other thing you have to do is create this thing that's called your actual, your server class. Uh, in my example, I call it foo server. And the server class, really it doesn't do much. It extends this class built in happy called restful server. And it's responsible for declaring what your resource providers are. And I'll show you an example of that as well in a moment. But basically, all you have to do in order to get this, this entire thing going is create those couple of classes. Happy takes care of basically everything else. Once you've built all of, all of the classes you need, uh, your last thing, and this is pretty standard in the world of Java, is you will bundle all of that stuff up into what's called a war file. Uh, war stands for web archive, and this is 
fairly standard Java server architecture, so anyone who's been doing servers for any length of time have probably seen these things before. Um, you bundle everything up into a war file and you deploy it to your favorite container. So throw it into Tomcat, throw it into Jetty, throw it into Wildfly, um, any of the others, I mean, WebSphere or I don't know what else, there's tons of them. So whatever your container is of choice, you, you package everything up and you deploy it into that and there you go, you've got a server. So let's dive into what the resource providers look like. This is an example of just a basic resource provider. I'm hoping you guys can read that at the back. I'm sure it's a little bit small. Um, the bottom line with these things is they, they really have to do one thing. They have to implement this interface called iResourceProvider. And iResourceProvider has one method, that's getResourceType. And in there, you, just, you have to return the class object that is the type of resource this thing declares. Uh, of course, this resource provider doesn't do anything. All it's doing is, is declaring what type of resource it is. You're gonna add one or more methods in there that actually implement a fire operation you want to support. So what do those look like? Well, this is probably even harder to see at the back, but let me sort of try and walk you through. Effectively, we've got annotations like at read, at create, at search, and you're just play, creating just plain methods that will either take as input or return as output the type of resource you're trying to deal with. So a read operation is annotated with at read, and it's got the signature public patient read, and it takes one parameter, which is of type ID param, and that's the, the ID, of, or ID type rather. And that's the type of resource that you're trying to read. Create takes a resource as its input and can return void or potentially it can return this other thing called a method outcome. Searches uh, are annotated with at search and this goes on and on and on. We've got annotations for like, there's at up update for creating update operations. There's at operation for dealing with fire extended operations. Uh, what else? Uh, there's all kinds. So basically all of the things, like all of the, all of the restful operations that are defined in the fire spec um, have annotations and sort of have a syntax for how you write these things. And sort of really important to realize here, you can put any logic you want inside those things. We're not really bound to any specific framework. So, I mean, I've seen examples where people have, have taken these resource providers and have just turned around and called other REST services. I've seen examples where people are reading all of their values from CSV files that are stored on disk. Uh, I've seen, of course, lots of examples of people making database calls or using something like Hibernate to interact with a database. Any of those will work. They're, they're all perfectly fine sort of options for, for dealing with how these things work. Um, also worth mentioning, this class has a bit of a bizarre name. It's called Example01 Stub Resource Provider. The reason I use that specific name with the Example01 in it is at the very end, I'm gonna link you to a GitHub repository. Uh, this is the Firestarters GitHub repo. And all of this code, as well as an entire project that uses it, can be found in that, uh, in that repository. So any of the examples you see here, if you want to actually try them, have a look for, just do a search for the name of the class in the Firestarters repository and you will find that class and be able to try it. Um, this link here, um, which I'm gonna click on and then show you. So this is the Happy Fire website, of course, uh, and if you want to get to this specific page, you just go to documentation and then you go to server. Um, there are tons of examples in here, and what I want to specifically direct you to is the second link under server, which is RESTful operations. If I click on that for one moment, the reason I'm going here, let's make that a little bit bigger, is that there are examples for every type of fire operations. So there's an example here for read, and it goes all over the place. If you want to do sort of advanced features, and I will just randomly choose conditional deletes. If you want to know how to build a conditional delete operation within a, fire, a happy fire server, here's a complete example of how one of those things would look. So whatever crazy fire thing you're trying to do, and believe me, there are a lot of crazy things you can do in fire, because it's a fairly exhaustive specification, there should be examples of, of how you'd implement any of those in a happy fire server somewhere on this page. So do take advantage of that. Ooh, that's not that. Uh, 
Um, finally, I was saying you have to create a, a REST server class, and this is really all this thing is. You create your class, you extend RESTful server, which is a happy fire framework thing, and you implement one method called initialize, and initialize, really, it has two purposes. One, you give it a fire context. Uh, anyone who was in this morning's session will remember that the fire context is the one universal thing in Happy Fire. Uh, every application needs a fire context for anything it's doing. So you create one of those, and then you register your resource providers. And that's actually it. All you need to do is create those little bits of Java code and package that up, and away you go. Uh, I'm not going to show the example right now because I don't think we have time, but certainly uh, that example can be found on the Firestarters repo. Uh, and the entire thing, the entire thing will work. Uh, the example that's in there actually is a little bit more exhaustive than what I've just showed you. It actually uses a hash map to simulate a database just to store resources. So in a few lines of code, you've got a server that you can upload resources to, you can search them, you can download them, and of course, they're just going in a hash map, so they're not getting saved anywhere, but they will persist as long as you don't restart the server. Um, I'm gonna skip a few things in the interest of time so that we can cover interceptors. So interceptors are probably the most powerful and the most interesting part of the entire framework, I would say. Um, I was mentioning this morning uh, in the other session that the client framework has an intercept, has a, or sorry, the Happy Fire client has an interceptor framework. Those are the words I'm looking for. Um, and honestly, whenever we get questions on the Google group, um, I mean, often they're about validation, but as long as they're not about validation, chances are the answer is create an interceptor. Uh, just because the interceptor framework is designed so that you can layer functionality on top of either the client or the server. So really most of the power in terms of adding crazy functionality on top comes from interceptors. Um, interceptors in the server world have quite a bit of power to sort of layer functionality on top. Uh, I'm sort of listing a few things they can do. I mean, you can use them to look at the requests as they come in and maybe block requests or log them or whatever. They can modify requests. So if you want to you know, prevent certain content from getting into your server, you can do that. They can deny requests. So if you want to add security, that's absolutely a thing you could do with interceptors. They can also handle responses in a bunch of ways. So interceptors have the ability to block responses or to mask them, you know, filter out certain parts of the responses or log responses or modify them. So they've got lots and lots of power in terms of what they can do. Uh, this diagram, which again, I'm sure can't be read at the back, has a little sort of sequence of the various methods that exist in the interceptor framework. When you create an interceptor, what you're doing is implementing this interface called iServer interceptor. Uh, and overriding one or more of its methods with your own functionality. Those methods have specific hook points. Um, and I mean, effectively, I'm not gonna go through all of them right now, but basically you can look at requests as they come in, you can look at responses before they go out, you can call into exception handling logic when the server detects exceptions. So there's all kinds of things you can do uh, with this interceptor framework, you know, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Happy comes with a whole bunch of built-in interceptors that all have all kinds of uses. Uh, these are a few of them. There are more, but I think these are ones that are worth drawing attention to. Uh, this class called Logging Interceptor is, I mean, it, it's probably the most useful of all. And as I'm sure you can guess from the name, it's used for logging things. Uh, the Logging Interceptor allows you to generate log lines for every request that comes in. It's really neat, actually. Um, it's got this sort of little templating language that allows you to specify exactly the format of the logs that it should generate. So if you want to log you know, just the source IP and the URL they called, you could do that. You can have it log headers or request bodies or response bodies or anything in between. So you've got lots of power there. And certainly, if you're trying to debug problems, having a really verbose log is useful. If you want to generate one of those old NCSA format logs that are often used by like analytics trackers and things like that, you can get one of those with the logging interceptor. So there's all kinds of options there. Uh, the cores interceptor, of course, is a useful one. If you are building a server that's gonna get called by JavaScript applications, there's a good chance you're gonna need to enable cores. 
uh, and the cores interceptor is a good way of doing that. Uh, we've got request and response validating interceptors, and I'm sure you can guess from the name, those are used to validate requests when they come in or responses before they go out. Uh, and they've got a lot of options there. You can use them to block non-conformant data or just to log warnings for non-conformant data or to call external functions. Lots of options there. Um, we've got this thing called response highlighter interceptor. This one, all of our examples has this turned on. Uh, the response highlighter interceptor gives you nice sort of pretty syntax highlighting. Um, I'm gonna dive in for a second and show you what that looks like. Uh, anyone who has ever been to our, ser our public servers, this is happy.fire.org, you've probably seen our sort of purple and pink color scheme. I have no idea where the colors came from, but this sort of nice HTML view, this is actually response highlighter interceptor that's generating that. So a default Happy Fire server is just gonna give you raw JSON or raw XML as a response. If you bring in the, the response highlighter interceptor, then you'll get this instead, which is a lot easier on the eyes if you're trying to develop with it. Um, and then finally, we've got authorization interceptor, um, which I think is its own topic. So let's talk about that in a moment. Um, before I talk about authorization interceptor, I will mention inside your RESTful server class, if you want to use an interceptor, all you do is you call register interceptor. So just like the providers, you create them, you register them. That's really all there is to it. So authorization interceptor. Um, authorization is, of course, a vast topic uh, and not one I could nearly do justice uh, in this little bit of time. But let's just say this. I mean, obviously, we are dealing with health data. I mean, we're all here doing fire because we're dealing with health data. Every health system out there, every jurisdiction, every hospital, every institution, every app is going to have its own definition of what appropriate security is. Uh, it would be impossible for anyone to ever write sort of a security framework for fire that just out of the box worked anywhere except for the place it was where it was written. Um, you know, the, the laws in Canada, for example, where I'm from, like we've got very specific laws around when it's okay for people to see data and who should get to see data and what bits they should see and who's allowed to look at what based on what else they've seen and all of that. Um, the idea with this thing we call the authorization interceptor is, I always describe it as being sort of a half-written interceptor. And what I mean by that is it's a class that sort of allows you to declare a bunch of rules about what an individual user is allowed to do, and the authorization interceptor will then take the, it'll, it does the heavy lifting of enforcing those rules. So to put this another way, in, your, in code that you write using authorization interceptor, you are going to look at the authorization header or however it is you do authentication. You are going to decide, okay, this user is allowed to maybe read this one patient's data, but they don't get any write access, as an example. And the authorization interceptor then will go and enforce those rules. So the authorization interceptor actually looks at individual requests as they come in and blocks anything which is not supposed to be happening. Um, hopefully that makes sense. I always think this is a weird thing to explain, but I mean, ultimately the idea is however it is that you, you know, your secure, whatever your security rules are, whatever security protocols you're using, whether it's HTD basic or OAuth or anything like that, you write some logic for handling the authentication part and figuring out what the users are allowed to do. Happy Fire takes care of the rest. So what does this look like? Um, it basically looks like this. You create an interceptor which extends the authorization interceptor and you handle authentication. So in my simple example here, and this is really just a dummy example, but I'm reading off of the request the authorization header. And of course, the authorization header is the header in HTTP where you would get an HTTP basic token or an OAuth bearer token or whatever your security thing is. Um, but there's a little bit of magic that I'm not showing here where I would go and talk to my database to find out what user I'm actually dealing with. And then you write a bunch of rules. So in this case, I am using this thing called rule builder to say I'm allowing the user to access the metadata endpoint. I'm allowing them to read all resources. 
and I'm allowing them to write any resources of type observation that are in the compartment belonging to patient one, two, three. So, I mean, if you have not dealt with compartments before, maybe this is not entirely intuitive what I'm doing here, but in really effectively three lines of code, I've just sort of allowed the current user read access to anything in the system, but I can, they can write any observations where the subject is patient one, two, three, and that's it. Any attempts to write observations to any other patient or to write a different type of resource are gonna get blocked by the authorization interceptor. So, I mean, hopefully based on this simple example, you can sort of appreciate the power that sits inside this in interceptor. Um, it allows you fairly quickly to write really complicated security rules, which is quite a nice thing. So that is that for the, uh, for the plain server framework. I'm now gonna talk about the JPA server framework. Um, I feel like I missed a slide at the start, which actually introduced the difference between these two, so I'll do that now. Um, Happy Fire has two server frameworks, one called the plain server framework, and that's the thing I just showed you, and one called the JPA server framework. The difference between these is this. The, the plain server framework, as I just showed you, allows you to write your own storage logic. It sort of works with this idea that you create a bunch of annotated methods, those annotated methods go and talk to your database, and you're sort of controlling the entire interaction. The JPA server framework, on the other hand, is a full-blown sort of server stack. It includes the, like it includes the database layer, it's got its own database schema, it includes all the write and the read logic, it includes the search logic, it includes everything else. So that's the, that's the sort of distinction between the two. The idea being that if you have a pre-existing system, whether it's a database or a set of files or whatever else, you probably just want the, the plain server. If you're starting completely from scratch and you just want a fire server to build on top of, you probably want the JPA server, just because it will, it's already got all of the storage logic pre-written for you. So. Um, the JPA server, I mean, we'll start with the name. So JPA, of course, stands for the Java Persistence Architecture. Uh, anyone who has been involved in Java for any length of time probably knows it more commonly as Hibernate. Um, Hibernate is sort of the, the most popular implementation of JPA, which is a, just a standard. Uh, the other one that's sometimes used as Eclipse Link, but we are fairly tied to Hibernate. So effectively, Happy's JPA server is Hibernate and a bit of stuff on top of it. It is fairly exhaustive in its support for Fire. I would definitely never try and claim that it supports all of Fire. Um, I can't imagine anyone has ever written a Fire server that supports all of Fire, but it's fairly exhaustive in its support. It certainly supports all of the resource types that are, uh, that are in Fire. It supports all of the usual CRUD operations, so you've got the ability to do creates and reads and updates and all of that. It's got support for searches, it's got all support for all kinds of fancy features that are in Fire, um, you know, e-tags, conditionals, patches, uh, a bunch of other stuff that's in there. It includes a terminology server, so you've got the ability to do things like value set expansion and concept maps and various things like that. It's got pretty good support for subscriptions. Uh, this is an active area for us right now is beefing up subscription support, but it does include a full-blown subscription processor, and it's got tons and tons of configuration, which is probably a key thing to mention. Uh, there are tons of options built into the server, so if you're thinking about building a real system on top of Happy Fire, uh, the JPA server, uh, certainly I would encourage you to spend some time looking at its configuration. Uh, there's all kinds of sort of like caching features built into it and things which can be enabled or disabled that'll have performance impacts on the way it works. So spend some time looking at configuration. That's well worth, uh, well worth mentioning. The way the thing works is as follows. At the top of the, the JPA stack is the plain server. We're built on top of the same server framework that everything else in Happy is. Um, that's particularly important just because it means that you can use the same interceptor framework the same sort of parser configuration rules that you would use in other parts of the library. You know, most importantly, you could layer on the, uh, you could layer on the Happy Fire authorization interceptor to add security rules on top of this. All of that's possible. At the very bottom of the stack, I will also mention that we've got Hibernate and we've got a database of your choice. 
Hibernate is nice in that it ab sort of abstracts the database logic and supports a bunch of different backends. Most people using this layer are using it with either Postgres or Oracle, I would say. That's probably 80% of people out there are using one of those two servers. But there are plenty of people using it with MySQL. There are plenty of people using it with, with SQL Server. There is at least one person using it with Cache. Uh, what else? There's, I've seen people using it with Firebird database. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples. But Hibernate is great that way. It allows you to, uh, to work against really a good number of databases. And there's trade-offs, of course, to all of that. We also have this thing called Lucene that sits next to the, the relational database. Lucene is used as a full text index, uh, and it allows you to do things like the underscore text operator, which gives you full text searching across anything that's stored in your database. Um, particularly worth mentioning, Lucene can be turned off. This is a, uh, a common question we get on the Google Groups. If you don't need full text searching, actually turning Lucene off is, is not a bad idea just because it, uh, it adds some clustering overhead if you ever want to get to, uh, to clustering servers. Um, oh yeah, also worth mentioning, all of our examples use a database platform called Derby. Um, and Derby sort of sits in the pl same spot as that stack as Postgres or Oracle would. I have to mention this because I've seen people make this mistake before. Derby is awesome for testing. It's a pure Java database, like it's actually written in Java, so you don't have to install anything to use it, which is nice. It just sort of builds itself into the server. Derby scales horribly, though, so do not try and use Derby in production. Uh, and I cannot stress this enough. All of our examples use it because it's great for sort of getting a server up quickly, but if you bring a Derby server up to production, one day you're going to get a call in the middle of the night that you're not going to enjoy. So do not try and use Derby in production. It is not a good idea. Um, yeah, I already mentioned Lucene. So the JPA server, I mean, I'm not going to go through all of the pieces because I just got my five-minute warning, or I think I'm about to anyway. But I will sort of point you to, there is a full-blown example that sits on the, on the Firestarters repository that is a complete Happy Fire server project uh, using the JPA server. And I mean, really all you need to do in order to get started with the JPA server is go to that page, check out that project, build it, and deploy it to your container of choice. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is we do have a module in Happy Fire called the Happy Fire CLI, the command line interface. Uh, the CLI tool is effectively a little server in a box. It's got a couple of other features in there that are not server related, but really this is the most important part of what this thing is. Um, with a single command, if you download this thing, you can have a little local server running on your, on your local laptop or PC or whatever you're doing that includes all of the functionality of Happy Fire JPA, and that includes terminology and subscriptions and full text indexing and all of that stuff. So if you want to get started with a really easy server, the CLI is a great tool for that. Um, yeah, that's that. I'm not gonna go on to advanced topics because we definitely don't have time for that. That is it, thank you all. I think I have a few minutes for questions, if anyone has any. Yes? So, mm, okay, so the question was, um, first off, do we have an example of a conditional update and how that would look? And then second, do we need to, do we need to sort of repeat that logic across each resource provider? Did I get that right? Awesome. So, I mean, first off, do we have an example? Let me, uh, let me show you that. I like that question, because sure we do. <laughs> so I'm gonna go on to Happy Fire. I'm gonna zoom out so we get a menu. I'm going to Documentation, I'm going to Server, and then I'm going to RESTful Operations. And the really nice thing is, once I'm on this, as long, like anything I'd want to do in Fire, I, can, I just hit Command F or Control F, and I'm gonna search for Conditional Update. And sure enough, here is an example of conditional update. Um, the conditional update is, I mean, this is how these things look. And I have to warn you that conditional update is a really annoying thing to implement from scratch. Um, the, the way conditional updates work, if you have not implemented one before, is you do a, an HTTP put, and it's going to be to, you know, slash patient slash something. 
But unlike a regular update where you're just doing a put to patient slash one, two, three, you're actually doing an update to a search URL. So you're doing a put to patient question mark family equals Agnew and given equals James. Um, which is super powerful as a client developer because it, I mean, the usual use case is you would do this to update the patient who has a given identifier. That's, that's like a common use case for conditional update. Um, that's the nice part. The, the, the bad part is it's really hard to implement this on the server side. Like I'm not going to sugarcoat that. It does mean that you're going to have to go through and parse the URL that came in, um, figure out what search parameters it has, implement a search that actually deals with that thing and then return an appropriate result. Uh, the JPA server has an implementation of this and certainly all of that is open source. So if you're trying to do this in a plain server, uh, you can use the way we did it in the JPA server as a guide. But I mean, no matter what you do, there is some pain in implementing conditional update. However, if you do it, your client developers will love you because it is a really neat feature actually. Um, the other part of that was do you need to sort of repeat this logic for every resource type? And I guess, yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, that is one sort of fundamental thing to the design of the Happy Fire server. You, I mean, the, way, the whole way the thing works is that you do create one resource provider per resource type. So if you're supporting 10 or 100 resource types, you are creating 10 or 100 classes for those things, which is a bit of an annoyance, truthfully. But it is the way it currently works. Yes. Cool, so the question was uh, interceptors that we had in the plane server, do we also have those in JPA? Yes, absolutely we do. Uh, it is a super common setup for people to use the JPA server and they'll usually add the response highlighter interceptor and the authorization interceptor. They'll put those two on top of JPA. That's, that's like almost a default configuration to do it that way. Sure. Cool. Well, if there's no further questions, thank you all.